We are kicking off with WWE, and ever since SmackDown, fans have been vehemently against The Rock, who they feel doesn't deserve a WrestleMania match against Roman Reigns over Cody Rhodes. The fans' opposition to this booking decision is played out at WWE events and on social media, and we're sure WWE's framing of this situation will only rile fans up even further. On WWE.com, WWE promoted The Rock's return by saying he stepped up to face Reigns this April and claimed that Cody refused to fight the Tribal Chief at WrestleMania 40. Not only does this headline make Cody out to be somewhat afraid of Reigns, which could not be further from the truth, but also enforces the idea that Rhodes will face Seth Rollins instead. Later today, WWE will host a WrestleMania 40 kickoff press conference, which The Rock, Roman Reigns, and Cody Rhodes are all expected to be a part of. This may be where we see Rhodes make his decision, but as far as WWE.com's concerned, this controversial booking is all thanks to Rhodes simply refusing to fight Roman Reigns. Later today, WWE will host a press conference set up for WrestleMania 40, where fans can expect more revelations about what will happen regarding the two-night show. The alleged People's Champion took to social media this week to hype his involvement with the press conference, and it went as well as one would expect. The Rock's post was flooded by pro-Cody messages, as fans continue to be relentless in letting it be known that they want Cody instead of the Brahma Bull. At this press conference, WWE must establish who will face Roman Reigns at WrestleMania 40, what Rhodes will do at the event, and if he'll face Seth Rollins. At this point, it's clear that The Rock will have a role at WrestleMania 40 in his first appearance at the Showcase of the Immortals in years. The Great One knows all about WrestleMania and has headlined the show multiple times, but does WWE actually need The Rock for this year's event? Not according to Seth Rollins, who in an interview with Good Morning Football emphasized the immense success WWE has been facing without The Rock's involvement. He said, Hey look man, if The Rock wants to jump on the bandwagon, ride my coattails into WrestleMania, that's fine with me. Look, I get it, WWE is the hottest it's ever been. We're selling out arenas, stadiums, we got two massive deals, SmackDown, the USA Network, and Raw signed the most lucrative television deal in the history of pro wrestling with Netflix. We're living life right now, we are huge. Rollins acknowledged The Rock's contributions to wrestling and showed his respect for him, but asserted that it's been himself, not The Rock, who's held WWE strong for the past decade, saying, For The Rock to want to come on board now, jump on my WrestleMania, get his toes wet, I get it. So mad respect to him for what he's done for our industry. So I got no problem with The Rock jumping on and doing his business for us. Like I said, he's riding my coattails, you need to remember that. Who's been on Raw for the last 10 years more than anybody? It's me, this guy, I get the credit, not him. So he can come in, he can get what he wants, he can take his little piece and go back to Hollywood to do his thing. We don't need ya. We love to have ya, but we don't need ya, big guy. These are some bold words by the reigning world heavyweight champion, who is often sided with the full-time roster over part-timers coming in, including The Rock's cousin, Roman Reigns. It'll be interesting to see if The Rock has any retort to these comments, as Seth believes it's nice to have The Rock back, but the show could and would go on ahead without the Brahma Bull. Seth Rollins certainly plans on competing at WrestleMania, even though he's currently recovering from an MCL injury suffered during his match with Jinder Mahal. During the show, Rollins reiterated his determination to return to the ring in time for WrestleMania 40, despite his MCL tear and meniscus injury, saying that his return will be no problem. Rollins admitted that he's not comfortable right now, but said it was fortunate he suffered a partial tear and not a full tear, and was able to avoid surgery for the time being. Seth's rehab is going great, according to the man himself, and ended by once again making clear that he will definitely be ready before WrestleMania, hopefully sometime in the next few weeks. Rollins is confident he'll be back in time for Mania, but who he'll face in April remains to be seen, and we're sure he'll be watching today's press conference very closely. Over to AEW Dynamite, which opened with Hangman Page angrily making his way to the ring for his number one contenders match with Swerve Strickland, who vowed there'd be no Mogul Embassy interference. Unlike previous encounters, the two approached this match slower at first, with a lockup and a couple of clean breaks before Page took the first shot that initiated a brawl. That brawl brought them out of the ring, and the commentary team did bring up an interesting point, questioning how far this feud can go after a home invasion and blood drinking. To their credit, Swerve and Page tried to wrestle a completely different match, focusing on traditional combat over bloody brutality, though that's not to say there weren't violent spots. 
The two have developed a fantastic chemistry as opponents, with each having a handful of standout moments, but Strickland may have had a couple more and really shined in this match. A much-deserved This Is Awesome chant broke out following a near-fall in this match that had callbacks to their previous matches, exciting spots, and crowd participation. Both men tried several times to get the win, but the bell rang just before Strickland could get the pin, ending the match in a time-limit draw with the crowd booing the decision. Strickland asked for five more minutes, but Page, close to completing his transformation into Magnum TA, said no, and it seems the hangman is on his way to a heel turn. Tony Schiavone announced that Tony Khan has now booked a three-way match between Samoa Joe, Page, and Swerve for the AEW World Title at Revolution. With the AEW World Tag Titles on the line, Sting and Darby Allin wasted no time in going after Big Bill and Ricky Starks in this exciting Tornado Tag Match. The two sides fought through the crowd for the first minute, so you could tell this was going to be chaos from the jump, and the Tornado format made the match even more exciting. There was an incredible spot when Big Bill caught and slammed Allen after a suicide dive, as this match was a series of great moments from bell to bell. The crowd were popping for every big spot, and when Starks removed the turnbuckle as Sting came in for the splash, causing the icon to hit the exposed metal, it seemed to be over. A spear from Starks only added to this belief, but Sting was able to kick out and would hit the Scorpion Death Drop to get the win and the tag titles. This marks Sting's first time holding a title since 2011, and it was great to see Sting's sons in attendance during Dynamite. As he and Allen celebrated, the Young Bucks attacked them with baseball bats from behind. The show ended with Nicholas and Matthew standing in white suits, covered in Allen's blood. When Vince McMahon stepped down from WWE in 2022, John Laurinaitis was fired from the company, and while McMahon forced a return in 2023, he didn't bring Big Johnny along. With both McMahon and Laurinaitis named in Janelle Grant's lawsuit, there's a huge spotlight on both men right now, and an allegation of misconduct has once again come to light. This case involves the late Ashley Massaro, as following her tragic demise in 2019, an affidavit was publicly available which claimed WWE had helped cover up an alleged sexual assault. Massaro alleged that she was assaulted at a military base in 2007, and at the time, WWE denied any wrongdoing regarding the allegation. With the Massaro allegations recently coming to light again, Laurinaitis issued a statement this week through his lawyer Edward Brennan to Vice.com which reads, Any allegations that Mr. Laurinaitis helped to cover up an alleged rape allegation is an outright lie. Johnny, like most upper-level management, at some time became aware of the allegations and ensured all proper WWE protocols were followed, including privacy for the alleged victim. We object to the use of the term cover-up as no such plan or plot ever took place to hide or assist in the alleged rape. Odds are we've seen the last of John Laurinaitis in WWE, as the company has shown no sign of bringing him back, and after his 2022 exit, many of his roles were covered by Bruce Prichard. What do you think about John Laurinaitis' statement? Do you think that WWE covered up Ashley Massaro's sexual assault allegations? Sound off in the comments section. While Vince McMahon was able to strong-arm his way back into WWE in January 2023, he's once again resigned, and this time, he doesn't have the influence to force his way back. The scandal against McMahon is huge, a serious situation for WWE, and while most superstars have kept quiet, Seth Rollins spoke about the matter this week. During an appearance on the Maggie and Perloff show, Rollins was asked about the allegations against McMahon and branded the whole situation as disgusting. He said, it's awful, it's terrible, I hate it, it's a disgusting situation. WWE and TKO have taken steps to ensure McMahon can't return, and WWE are also looking to keep McMahon out of the WWE 2K24 video game, despite his obvious involvement in WWE history. It was reported that TKO CEO Ari Emanuel and TKO President and COO Mark Shapiro contacted Vince McMahon, advising him that resigning would be in the best interest of the company. While McMahon may be gone, The Hollywood Reporter notes that McMahon may continue to wield power in the company, given his 10% ownership of all outstanding shares. The report read, Sources say that even while McMahon was no longer an active member of the executive team, he would weigh in on creative decisions, reaching out to employees by email and text with suggestions. While McMahon used his power as controlling shareholder to reinstall himself, the new TKO is firmly controlled by Endeavor, making any sort of official comeback unlikely. Just a couple of months after the TKO deal closed last September, McMahon filed with the SEC to sell some $700 million worth of stock in the company, a sizable chunk of his holdings. 
That being said, he still owns a big portion of the firm, representing about 10% of shares outstanding. It may not be enough to reappoint himself to the board, but enough to carry influence. WWE and UFC were officially merged into TKO last year with a ceremony on the New York Stock Exchange, and TKO have been aware of the McMahon situation with Grant for some time. Fightful Select reports that TKO became aware of the situation post-merger, and someone believes they would have managed the rollout differently if they had known Grant's lawsuit was coming. It was also confirmed that TKO were aware of the Grant lawsuit when they had Vince McMahon present for the Netflix deal last month, mere days before the lawsuit would be made public. McMahon may be gone, but the lawsuit against him isn't going anywhere, and we'll continue to follow this situation for further updates. During the Royal Rumble press conference, Triple H was asked if he'd read the lawsuit against his father-in-law, to which WWE's chief content officer said he had not. Triple H's response sparked backlash, with many questioning how he hadn't read up on such an important situation, but recently, Kevin Nash defended his friend and click ally. On his Click This podcast, Nash pointed out that Triple H was especially busy that week, with the Royal Rumble event and two Royal Rumble matches needing to be booked in time. Nash also pointed out how two of WWE's top stars, Seth Rollins and CM Punk, are out injured, with Triple H having to pick up the pieces and shift his booking from there. The WWE Hall of Famer also questioned what good it would have done for Triple H to read the lawsuit, considering he had a ton of work to do, and considering McMahon had already resigned by that point. Triple H is looking to move ahead with WWE's work in spite of the McMahon lawsuit, but with Vince continuing to be a dark cloud over the company, that may prove to be easier said than done. We've got some huge news from TNA Wrestling now, as less than a month after the relaunch at Hard to Kill, Scott Demore has been removed as TNA president. Anthem Sports and Entertainment Inc. has replaced Demore with Anthony Saccone, who serves as Anthem's president and in an effort to solidify TNA's position with Anthem. In his first statement as TNA president, Saccone spoke about his appointment in the role and was appreciative for all the work Demore had done for TNA. He said, this move is intended to further integrate TNA Wrestling into the entertainment group of Anthem Sports and Entertainment as we work to leverage the resources of the entire company to add more value in areas such as production, distribution, marketing, viewership, customer acquisition, digital revenue streams, ad sales and sponsorships, and digital tech operations, among others. Everyone at Anthem Sports and Entertainment is appreciative and thankful for the years of dedication that Scott Demore gave to Anthem and TNA Wrestling. Scott has been a part of TNA since 2003, holding many key roles. He played a vital role in the growth of the company and the evolution to its strong industry reputation today, including the 2024 return of the TNA wrestling brand itself. I personally want to thank Scott for the passion he brought to the business and his personal touch with talent. Saccone added that TNA is in a position to take a big leap towards its next stage of growth and expansion and called Hard to Kill one of the best pro wrestling shows he's ever attended. He also said that there will be many exciting, groundbreaking announcements over the next few months and was appreciative of the TNA wrestling roster of in-ring talent who compete each week. Saccone concluded by acknowledging that departures of well-respected executives like Demore can create uncertainty, but he's committed to elevating the operations of TNA. So why is Demore out as TNA wrestling's president? Well, when Fightful spoke to one talent, they reiterated the idea that Anthem wanted TNA to be closer to the Anthem brand. With that said, another TNA wrestler said they could see Anthem doing that, but made it clear that Demore saved TNA. According to PW Insider, Saccone gave a prepared statement during a meeting with TNA wrestlers, but nothing specific was stated about TNA's creative process going forward. At this time, only Demore has left TNA, but talents at this meeting were told Scott stepped down as president, which is not the truth at all. Talents were also not given a chance to ask any questions, with one TNA personality telling PW Insider that Anthem has a lot of work to do after the unceremonious removal of Demore. Other TNA wrestlers said that they were taking a wait-and-see approach and aren't ready to condemn Anthem for this change until they see how Saccone fares in the president role. On Twitter, former TNA announcer Dave Penzer described removing Demore as a massive loss and said without Scott, TNA would be a video library owned by WWE. WWE's own Naomi also weighed in on the situation, saying that we don't play about, and the self-professed TNA knockout for life has often shown her love and appreciation for Scott Demore. This is a developing situation that will see plenty more information to come, but for the time being, the wrestling world is in shock following the removal of Scott Demore. 
Demore's exit from TNA comes at an interesting time, considering the company's recent partnership with WWE. Jordan Grace shocked the world with her performance in the Women's Royal Rumble match, and the TNA Knockouts champion's involvement came about thanks to Demore. As PW Insider reports, the belief is that Scott Demore was heavily involved with building the potential relationship between the two sides. If and how it continues to develop remains to be seen, but TNA will have to tap someone else to continue to build that rapport with Paul Levesque and the rest of WWE. On the Royal Rumble press conference, Triple H thanked TNA for allowing WWE to use Grace in the match, and we'll have to see if WWE is so eager to work with the company's new president. With CM Punk out on the injured list, it was recently said by Ace Steel that WWE had considered him for a commentary role, which would keep him on TV whilst he recovers from a torn triceps. In an update from Fightful Select, though, it was said that WWE has had no discussions about Punk commentating and that this was simply a suggestion of Steel's and nothing more. Furthermore, it was said that despite previous belief, Punk is not expected to be at the Performance Center as right now, the best thing for Punk's recovery is to be off the road and relaxing at home. In 2024, Cody Rhodes is one of the most beloved and level-headed WWE superstars on the roster, with his charming demeanor and professionalism making him an excellent company spokesman. With that said, Cody wasn't always so cool, calm, and collected, and during an episode of Café de René, Justin Gabriel recalled a real fight with Rhodes over creative plans. He said, Me and Cody back in the day had a little tiff, but nothing serious. He went to creative and he got some storylines kiboshed, but nothing too serious. I think we got into a fist fight over it once. We sorted that out real quick. I'm sure he doesn't even remember that. When Rhodes confronted Gabriel, the South African thought it was a joke and pushed Rhodes away and laughed it off, which only angered the future AEW founder even further. Booker T and Mark Henry were on hand to break the fight up, and it's clear that Rhodes has matured immensely in the years since his fight with the Nexus alum. On this week's NXT, Carmelo Hayes opened the show to explain himself, but after a chorus of boos and chants from the crowd, simply said, not yet, and walked to the back. It appears that those chants that Melo did cross a line, as during a commercial break, fans were cautioned by staff about their fuck you Melo chant and asked to mind their language. The segment had to be heavily censored, according to PW Insider, and while Melo did explain himself later in the show, we'll have to see if the crowd watched their tone from here on. Over to AEW now as Tony Khan was on last night's Dynamite with a huge announcement, that being that AEW will be returning to Boston's TD Garden on March 13th. That may not seem like a huge deal on the surface, but Khan added that it'll be one of the most important nights in wrestling, and said the show would be called AEW Big Business. Based on these teases, it certainly sounds like Khan has something big planned, and many believe that show will see the long-awaited arrival of Mercedes Monet. The show being in Mercedes' hometown and the business branding certainly implies that the boss will be at the event, and Fightful Select has added an update to this situation. While there was contemplation within AEW over whether to announce or debut Monet, it was decided to hold off until the TD Garden show. Fightful added that the plan is for Monet to be at the show, which has been the plan for weeks, and it was added that Mercedes has been on AEW's payroll since January. AEW clearly has big plans for Mercedes Monet, and on Twitter, Monet posted some lyrics to her WWE theme song, Sky's the Limit. Mercedes Monet has been speculated to join AEW pretty much since she left WWE in 2022, and it now appears we are just over a month away from the boss finally being All Elite. More from AEW Dynamite as Tony Storm picked up a textbook win over Red Velvet, and it was only until Deanna Perrazzo got involved that Storm broke her submission hold. Luther got between them and the segment ended with Storm leaving without further incident. Velvet did a good job despite being in an unwinnable situation. Brian Danielson, Claudio Castagnoli, and John Moxley came out to a huge ovation as they prepared for a trios bout against Volador Jr., Hechicero, and Mascara Dorada. The way Mox was standing in the ring when the CMLL stars made their entrance was low-key hilarious, and after last week's fantastic singles match, it was right for Danielson and Hechicero to start things off. Unsurprisingly, the two had another excellent showcase with Hechicero's innovative style using moves that don't even have names yet. The two traded holds and counters as Brian showed signs of frustration before Castagnoli and Dorado tagged in and the Swiss Superman brushed off several chops. Mox and Volador finally tagged in and started trading big right hands, and while this was a clash of different styles, all six men did a terrific job playing to each other's strengths. 
Castagnoli ended up resorting to a low blow on Hechicero to get the win, but the BCC was immediately confronted by a few more luchadors from the crowd. BCC was joined by a few more members of the AEW locker room to keep it even. There was no big brawl, but it feels like we are working towards a CMLL versus AEW feud. In the latest chapter of the long story of Chris Jericho and the Don Callis family, the Canadian came up short against Kanosuke Takeshita, who got the win with Jericho's Lion Tamer submission. The match had an odd pace to it, though we appreciate Takeshita getting the unlikely win, and we imagine that AEW will continue to follow on with this story. And that was this week's AEW Dynamite, and what did you think? Let us know below!